And joining us for the very first time, I'd like you all to give an extra warm welcome to David starting the evening with the story of The Haunting of Hamlet. It's noir out. It's noir out there and in here. It was a cold, foggy midnight in Elsinore. Evil lurked in every shadow. An emergency patrol on high alert watched around the clock because of troop movements led by young Fortinbras, son of an old enemy of the state. According to a top secret report filed by conscripts of the Danish Homeland Security Militia, an occult apparition had been seen stalking the battlements in the shape of the late king of Denmark, old Hamlet, the old man. Great, a paranormal case, damn it. Generally, paranormal dangers would not be investigated, but the political nature of the sighting caused concern. Marcellus, a corporal, and Horatio, civilian investigator, confirmed the report. Circumventing usual channels, they took that information to young Hamlet, son of the dead king, and a person of interest to the authorities. Though Hamlet is in grief at his father's recent death and appalled at the illicit and rapid marriage of his mother to his father's brother, and perhaps Hamlet miffed at not being chosen to succeed his father as king by the to succeed his father as, uh, as king by the court elite insiders. Hamlet's first reaction to the news of the ghost was not indecisive. The young man said, if it assume my noble father's person, I'll speak to it, though hell itself should gape and bid me hold my peace. He also got his associates to keep their contact with him absolutely secret for operational reasons, even if he adopted an antic disposition. Subsequently, flouting conventional ethics in a shark-infested royal court. Young Hamlet accepted the mission he was given by the ghost and discharged his duty according to his conscience. First job, figure out what kind of ghost he met. Where did my notes go? Popular tradition from Goethe and Samuel Coleridge to Freudian psychoanalysis has concentrated on Hamlet as an overly sensitive prince, constitutionally unable to act. For example, in the voiceover introducing his 1948 film adaptation of Hamlet, which I hate, Laurence Olivier says <laughs> that, that Hamlet is the tragedy of a man who could not make up his mind. And a local newspaper review here, where it's noir also, of the current ACT production of Hamlet echoes Olivier's emphasis. He may be the protagonist of one of William Shakespeare's most famous tragedies, but Hamlet can off be awfully easy to make fun of. The gloomy prince of Denmark knows his father's own brother killed him to steal both the throne and his wife. He knows this because his father's ghost came back explicitly to tell Hamlet all this and to demand vengeance. But still, Hamlet hems and haws about what to do while he pretends to be losing his mind just to mess with people. That was in our local newspaper. <laughs> well, I say Olivier and the newsmen have got it wrong. I say the big shots like Goethe, Coleridge, and Freud lit crit sideman Ernie Jones. These guys lost sight of the cause, Ham the case Hamlet was trying to solve. The way I've come to see the play, the biggest clue is right there at the start. Now, before I get ahead of myself, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. You probably first encountered the case of Hamlet and the Ghost, back in high school, sometime after your Sherlock Holmes stage, and maybe during your Raymond Chandler or Dashiell Hammett stage, if you're lucky. It might have started with this. Here's the cast of the main characters to refresh your memory. When the play starts, the old man, the king, is dead, and his brother has remarried the dead guy's wife, just a month after a serpent supposedly bit and killed the old man in the garden one day. Sheesh, how Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel do you have to get around here to get suspicious with a garden and a snake and a brother supplanting another? Listen, before the play also, 
the old man had killed another guy's old man, the boss in Norway, and it looks like there could be war. That's the Fortinbras character I mentioned up top, but Cliffy left him out. Back to the chart. At the end of the play, which starts with Hamlet being told to lay off his sinful mom and whack the uncle, all these people are dead, dead, dead. Hamlet whacked Polonius himself, set up his old frat bro rats, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and Ophelia dies in sadness and madness. So there you are. Back in Denmark, after getting the English to whack them, Hamlet duels, whack those two guys, Hamlet duels and kills, helps kill Laertes, kills Claudius, and gets killed too. Okay, so now your memory's refreshed. Let's get back to the beginning. Most of the whole first act is about the ghost. The most important character in the first part of the play is the ghost, not Hamlet. The ghost is not a singular hallucination like Banquo's ghost in Macbeth. The ghost is not a soothsayer predicting the future. This is Dad the King, or a demon, or a wandering soul on a mission to inform and to tell the son, the prince, what happened to him and what the son must do. The, pr the prince at the start is melancholic and grieving, and maybe the incest of his mom and uncle, or the war fears of the sudden death of a head of the body politics has everyone on edge. Even that border security soldier smells something rotten in Denmark. Now you and I, we've got just a few minutes to talk about this case, so let's talk about the theology first, because in my opinion, the theology precedes the psychology. 1600, when the play goes on, the Reformation's well underway, and there's three schools of thought to define what you should do when you're up against a ghost as a witness. Now, I want to emphasize old Hamlet is also acting like a parent and a king by telling the prince what he's got to do. He's not just showing up and mumbling. He's telling the prince what to do. The ghost drops hints right and left that he's in Catholic purgatory. He says he's there for a certain time, that he's going through a process of purgation, that it's sulfurous, and he's suffering and tormented horribly, just like Catholic purgatory. He complains about his awful death because he was murdered bad. What does it mean to be murdered bad? No last rites, no final communion, no preparation of his soul by deathbed confession. Now, here's a strange angle on this ghost case. Horatio and Hamlet both studied at Wittenberg, the cradle of the Reformation, Martin Luther's home base. And Denmark, at the time the play was performed, was a notorious bulwark of the Lutheran church. So it's kind of confusing. So it's, it's almost dead cert that the dad's talking about experiences that make sense to a Catholic and pouring those words right at his own Protestant kid and the kid's best pal. So Shakespeare used a lot of ghosts, Richard II, Banquo, but Hamlet's, Hamlet's ghost was a realer ghost for the theater of his time than the prevailing standard of puppets for revelation of important information, a little attention-grabbing prologue for the groundlings. Shakespeare's ghost is, has an actuality and, and has an impact on different characters in different ways who have different opinions about the spirit. Boy, you guys are slow, the spirit world. <laughs> These different, uh, hey, just because I'm a fast-talking Seamus doesn't mean you can't keep up. <laughs> All right, these different opinions were likely entertained by different parts of the audience, too. And if this was uh, like a G.B. Shaw play or something, they'd spend the next two hours in witty, smart discussion about the nature of the ghost. Then who'd be indecisive? And how much blood would be spilled, huh? Back to our play. The ghost dominates Act 1 on land and underground. Then in Act 3, he shows up again to rescue the queen and redirect Hamlet to the main job of killing the king. In act one, the king, the ghost is seen by four people who have three typical different points of view on this whole topic of what to do when you encounter a spirit or a ghost. The three points of view are not surprise, fear, fanatical devotion of the Pope. The three schools of thought are Catholic, with spirits from purgatory haunting us, yeah, with maybe some demonic demonic spoofing by evil spirits as convincing-looking ghosts. The Protestant type one, almost all ghosts are devils in the form of ghosts, maybe once in a while an angel or two. In Protestant type two, there's heaven and hell, but no purgatory and no spirits, ghosts or sprites. What there are are hallucinations, especially in the morbidly melancholic, and there's trickery by rogues. <laughs> rogues. Okay, so there's a whole process 
of sorting out an honest ghost from a wicked one. There's Latin questions, and Horatio, was, he was in college, he's a scholar, he's urged to interact with the ghost when they see it. And um, uh, the, the key thing is, um, is it a demonic origin ghost or a divine one, what's going on? So there's this whole process where Horatio is dragged in by border security to talk to the ghost, because he's a scholar, college boy, and he's got the Latin knowledge so in case of demonic activity, he can say the right exorcism things to be safe. <laughs> these are things that were probably understood well by Elizabethan audience. He's also been taught about all these questions, okay, and, uh, and how, to, how to go through like a disciplined process for, for sorting these things out. So the interesting thing is, uh, as detective Professor Stephen Greenblatt tells me, almost all rituals in this whole play for managing grief and reducing any kind of anxiety, either personal or collective, in the face of death, are either disrupted or poisoned through the whole play. Now, the second point of view about ghosts is a Protestant one. And let's summarize it and say that mostly it's the work of the devil. There's an important part of the... Uh, Old Testament, where there's a witch conjuring the apparition of Samuel for King Saul. So that looks like solid scriptural support. Um, but the rest of purgatory and everything was a scam to many, many uh, Protestants. And there was a whole cash flow angle where the Catholic Church monetized uh, indulgences and all kinds of stuff. So we'll just uh, <laughs> uh, skip through that. There's some wonderful books on Internet Archive. Third... <laughs> A I want to direct your attention, like, this is not a minor topic for the audience and both the elite and the, and the popular folks. Um, the, the third school of thoughts, thought about ghosts and spirits gadding about at night is, is even more, more skeptical than, uh, than the last one. Now, I just wanted to show, oops, that this is written by King. A king wrote a book on demonology, the guy who succeeded Queen Elizabeth, King James I, while he was king of Scotland. And then another guy with the name Scott uh, basically <laughs> took even more skeptical view and basically said everything is either in a hallucination or trickery by some rogue. So all three schools of thought that thought that people were very melancholic, like Hamlet was at the start of the play, are much more prone to spectral visitations. Spirit buster. Now in the, in, in the case file, a ghost is reported to have complained about a particularly bad death. It seems so harsh to Hamlet that he wants the same cruel death for his uncle. Now, we come to the charge the ghost made to the prince's son, revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. But there's strings attached. And most people forget these. Hamlet almost forgot them too. Leave your mother alone. <laughs> Even though the, the ghost also revealed that she had been an adulterer. It went without saying that the sitting king is almost above the law. To get the dirty work of removing the dirty king from his throne and his bed, to do that work in public would shame the house of Hamlet, hurt the state, and very much not leave the queen out of it. Hamlet's got a mission. He's got to accept it as his prime duty or not. He does accept it, especially after he and Horatio followed most or all of the procedures in the traditional discretio spiritum for paranormal investigation. That's what happens in Act One. This was, gonna, <laughs> this was gonna have to be a very dirty job with no lawyers, no Robert Mueller. My recommendation would have been a quiet poison, but Hamlet didn't play it that way. Secrecy's job one. The ghost checks in, and he does so in a way that's very, very creepy. He's underneath, which is much more demonic. Uh, hopefully, yeah, we're gonna zip along. Um, so uh, here's Hamlet's to-do list. If he you know, uh, after, after this uh, proper investigation, paranormal investigation, it's keep it secret. Then after you have an encounter with something that's spooky, you pray fast, you have to be really sober. That only ended up attracting even more attention in the court and more surveillance of his activities and his feelings. Um, and he's got to check out the, the old man's story. You just don't know whether a, a ghost for sure is always telling the truth. That guy in the San Jose Mercury, not right. So if verified, you got to kill the king and leave mom alone. Now, the evidence that the ghost may or may not have good information and may or may not be from, have, from purgatory or hell is complicated to go through. There's a lot of controversy. But I'll just say, if you're underground, that's not a good sign. 
And the second thing, this is a really bad sign, is if you're asking for more sins, like homicide. <laughs> and uncle side. So I just want to say, like, you know, especially as another reply to that, that newspaper review, how do you feel carrying the triple burden of determining a ghost veracity about adultery, murder, and incest in your family, and doing it the whole time under constant surveillance? <laughs> wow. Inappropriate jokes are being excluded from my mind. So you suffer and express the buffoonery of an emotion which cannot yet find a satisfying outlet. Yeah. That's my favorite version. Ophelia's brother, Laertes, and her dad, Polonius, boss Ophelia around. They force her to break up with Hamlet. She's pretty much the nicest person in the whole play, except maybe Horatio, and she's got almost no power except to check out in madness and death. Now, Hamlet didn't say, I don't care who loves who, I won't play the sap for you. Sam Spade did. Hamlet's sweeties being squeezed hard and not in a good way. She's turning over Hamlet's personal, intimate communications with her to the king's right-hand man, her dad. Her dad and controlling brother tell her to break it off with Hamlet. She does. Then they tell her to spy on him. She does. Hamlet's fast-talking, fancy antics with her are kind of cruel. But that's just the lousy throw the dice for fair Ophelia. Dice thrown by men. Well, you know what happens. The play, the play, the mousetrap. The play within the play that's used to verify guilt means a lot more in light of the big open question that defines job three on his to-do to list. Hamlet has got to figure out whether the ghost info on the regicide is a bum steer. It's an open question and on that, I insist. And about what Hamlet says here, I'm no Elizabethan ghost detective myself, but just because the intel is good does not make the ghost free from the possibility of being demonic. Not so far as I can see, especially in light of the whole homicidal revenge demands. Now in the play, a traveling theater troupe, an act of poisoning of the king, in just the way that the ghost described. Horatio reports to Hamlet that at that point, the usually smooth King Claudius gave a tell, betrayed his guilt. So job three's done, now the time to kill has come. So if you throw out act one and dismiss the importance of the details the ghost gave Hamlet and the importance of job three, sure, maybe Hamlet looks like a procrastinator. But why not listen to what he says? He has a chance to kill Claudius. He's praying. He doesn't want to kill him then. He says he wants to give Claudius the same kind of horrible death his dad got so that Claudius' post-mortem suffering as a tormented soul will be prolonged. Now in Act 3, after the opportunity to kill Claudius at prayer is passed, Hamlet's talking to his mom privately. Well, maybe not so private. Polonius, the kind of rents Priebus of the Claudius regime. <laughs> His once possible future father-in-law, the father of his once one true sweetie, gets gutted by Hamlet after messing up surveillance ops. The episode does not much chasten Hamlet's drive to vengeance, which is somewhat contrary to the procrastinator label. I just want to say, my favorite film version of any Shakespeare scene is Brana's version of this scene. Blood pouring across the floor. So, with his, after, <laughs> after he whacks Polonius, he's continue, um, Hamlet's talking to his mom and rebuking her and rebuking her and, um, uh, for her relationship to the lousy uncle, especially in comparison to Hamlet's super dad. The ghost reappears to keep Hamlet on track just as he's about to spell out the charge of regicide. The ghost says Hamlet's going off mission. Remember the mission. Leave mom to heaven and kill the king. So he protects, the ghost protects the queen from disclosure of her first husband's murder. And we already know the queen's perplexed reaction to the mousetrap should have cleared her by now. But usually that scene is played in movies and, and live stage so quickly, you miss a lot. I usually missed all, almost all the relevant detail in that scene. Um, so a lot of murders <laughs> ensue. Um, Hamlet is actually quite rash um, and takes a lot of chances and he gets lucky. He has a lot of happy accidents. His confidence is booing. 
Uh, he does always question his own focus, but he's on the move. Ophelia dies, Laertes has his need for vengeance for his dad and sister, aimed at Hamlet by sneaky Claudius, poison here and there, big sword fight, whammo, everyone is dead except Horatio and Fortinbras. The ghost's mission is complete through the action of the prince and circumstance. But like many messy crime cases with sex and politics all mixed together, a lot of people get hurt along the way. It's not, not Chinatown, Horatio, it's Denmark. <laughs> How'd you feel carrying the triple burden of determining a ghost's veracity in your family and being under constant surveillance the whole time? I went to Denmark four years ago to check up on the cold case, went to Elsinore, hung out with the regulars. They say the ghost has not been back, except in fictional form. Every generation accepts and transforms tradition. We all got our Hamlet now, our ghost. It's not necessarily the same as Olivier's or Freud's or Sammy Coleridge, that poor opioid addicted bastard. The present we invent occults the past. Or should I say it occults the many pasts that we have to pick and choose among. When I was there, the Danes I met seemed to think something was rotten there. Try to praise them for saving Denmark's Jews from the Nazis. Well. If we hadn't been so xenophobic, maybe there wouldn't have been just 4,000 to save, they said. They made fun of their own cursing and rudeness, always in comparison to their much better behaved Swedes and neighbors. And they made fun of their language. Um, uh, in Act 1, Scene 4, Hamlet is talking with his buddy Horatio about the drinking and partying the king his uncle is having the same night Hamlet and Horatio are out stalking the ghosts. It's a it's a big custom there to make a big racket to celebrate one's drinking ability, but more honored in the breach than the observance. Then Hamlet says being heavy drinkers has just has totally disgraced the reputation of Denmark, which otherwise has earned the highest merit. The dram of evil doth all the noble substance often doubt to his own scandal. Well, it's noir out there, and it's noir in here. There's not even a dram of fine poisonous particles in each breath of air to pollute our lungs on this breathless noir night. But I agree with the fair prince to drams of poison drams of drink to Denmark. <laughs>